As I said, last week we moved from uh, the life lessons of Joseph into the life lessons of Daniel, right? And just as a real quick refresher, especially if you're not familiar with uh, the book of Daniel, um, Daniel was one of the ones taken captive when Jerusalem fell. He was taken to, to Babylon, right? And along with some of his friends, um, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, okay? Uh, these four young men, right? They're smart, uh, they're healthy, they're good looking, they're exactly the kind that King Nebuchadnezzar liked to have serving in his palace. I mean, he looked for the beautiful people to be to surround himself with. And um, those that were taken captive to Babylon, they only took the, the best and the brightest, and they put them, they tried to assimilate them into the culture so they would add something to the Babylonian culture. All right. And so these guys end up spending three years being assimilated, right, and trained uh, for the job of working in Nebuchadnezzar's uh, palace, right? And the truth is, they excel at everything that they do. God's hand of favor is on them. And, and when they uh, graduate from the training, they're given positions of, of real responsibility, okay? That's how much they excel. There's only one problem, okay? And we're told right from the very beginning that they resolve themselves not to defile themselves and not to worship any of the foreign gods, which was one of the things that they were supposed to do. Okay, now um, their convictions with regard to their faith, especially when it comes to the idol worship, okay, is going to get them into a lot of trouble. Uh, they first experience some pressure, a little bit of persecution, uh, but they're given a little bit of, of grace with that. Um, but this week, okay, just you know, the heat's really going to be literally uh, turned up on them, as now they're going to face uh, the threat of death if they don't conform. Okay, so. Uh, Let's begin, now we're in Daniel chapter 3, with verse 1. King, King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Okay, so uh, King Nebuchadnezzar literally erects um, a statue, a monument to himself. And it's the biggest gold statue anywhere around Right in the middle of the country, he has this 90-foot, um, basically a picture of himself, right, a statue of himself erected, okay? And um, along with that comes this decree, right? He issues this decree that every day there will be a signal that would sound, and everyone in uh, Babylon, that regardless of where you came from, because like I said, they assimilated a lot of other cultures in there, it didn't matter your national origin. When the signal sounded, you need to get down on your knees, and you need to worship the idol, okay, that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, okay? And along with the decree comes a penalty for noncompliance. So let's actually read next from Daniel chapter 3, verse 6. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Okay, and so um, anyone who refuses, right, to bow down and worship this golden statue of Nebuchadnezzar, right, will be put to death. It's going to be a horrible death. They're going to be thrown uh, alive into this furnace and burned up alive. Okay? Um, and so, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar's a, a scary guy. Everyone's afraid of him. And, and so when the signal is given, virtually everyone um, in the kingdom does what they're supposed to do. Virtually everyone gets down uh, and bows down to this strategy. Okay? That is, everyone except this small group of Hebrew young men. So let's pick it up next in Daniel 3, verse 12. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. Okay, so now uh, one of the things I needed to point out from last week is uh, part of being assimilated means that you need to give up your other national name and everybody was given a Babylonian name. Okay, so now going by their Babylonian names, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, very good about your pronunciation, just so you know, um, they refuse. They will not bow down. Okay, they will remain faithful to the one and only true God. Okay, and they will bow down to no one else. Not Nebuchadnezzar, not some idol, not anyone. 
Okay, so uh, Nebuchadnezzar hears about it, right? And he goes into this rage. I mean, nobody had ever stood up to him before or refused anything that he requested. Okay, so he orders the three young Hebrew boys to be brought before him. Okay, so next let's go from Daniel 3, verses 14 and 15. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, it, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Okay, so Nebuchadnezzar gives him one last chance, right? Either bow down and worship the statue or die. And just so you know, it's going to be a horrible, horrible death. Now, guys, I have to say, I've never been in that situation. I've never had my life threatened because of my faith. I mean, sometimes I felt a little uncomfortable, uh, depending on the people I was around, but I've never had my life threatened uh, because of uh, my faith. Um, but I have, I have to share this story with you. This was about 20 years ago. Um, I had the honor of actually ministering to a small group of young men who were living under that very same threat. Okay, so let me kind of give you this story. Um, this is a little, a little bit longer one, but I think you guys will appreciate it. This was 2003, okay? And at the time, Nicole and I had been Christians for all of about two years, okay? And um, all of a sudden, God put it on her heart. Then she proceeded to put it on my heart, because that's what uh, she does sometimes, that we needed to go on a missions trip. Okay, um, we were doing everything Christians do. I mean, I was older, 40 something at the time, and I felt like I'd missed out on so much. It's like, man, if this is something Christians do, I want to do it. I want to experience everything that there is to do. And, and Nicole, uh, like I said, she came to me, it's like, oh, we should do a mission trip. I'm like, okay, cool. Um, uh, let's, you proposed it to the, the pastor, and so she went to the pastor of the church we were at at the time and said, yeah, I want to do a short term mission trip. He was very supportive. Is the only thing that he did say is, uh, since God put it on your heart, you need to organize it and you need to lead the team. Now, pastors are really good at that, you know. It's like, uh, otherwise, people just put everything on you. It's like, okay, well, God put it on your heart. I'm all for it. You do it though, okay? And so, um, to make a long story short, uh, Nicole did a really super job of pulling it all together. I mean, she's a really good organizer, and it's kind of right up her alley. And um, it seemed like everyone on the team, there were like 20 of us all together. Um, and uh, everybody really seemed to respond really well to her leadership style. Everybody on the team except one person. You know who that was? Me. Okay? Um, for some reason, having Nicole tell me what I needed to do and how I needed to do it all the time, it just didn't sit very well with me. Um, now, some of you guys know before we became Christians, we were um, had a pretty volatile history. Okay, we only been Christians for a couple of years. God, I mean, God wasn't done transforming us uh, yet. That a lot of that stuff has changed. But in those days, I was like uh, really resistant to a lot of the stuff the cold wanted to try to tell me to do. Okay, and so she was the team leader only because uh, I was a little bit lazy. I didn't want to lead. I was willing to go. Actually, she didn't give me a choice. You know, you got to come with me. I don't want to do this by myself. And so uh, I agreed that I would go. Um, anyway. Um, about two-thirds of the way through the trip, and we were there for, what, 10 days, something like that? So uh, maybe about day seven or eight, I can't remember exactly when, um, I mutinied, okay? Um, and I decided to go on on my own. I went to a whole different country, do my own thing, on my own, like, personal missions trip, okay? Now, let me kind of explain that to you so that I don't get the wrong uh, impression. Okay, uh, our team was predominantly women and teens. Okay, of the 20 of us, there were only three men, including me. Okay, and um, I'm gonna put the, the pictures up at the very end. Okay, I'll show you the, I'll show you the team. I got a few pictures that I'll share with you at the, at the end of this. Okay, um, but uh, because of the makeup of the team, okay, Nicole wanted to get a, a mission strip that suited that. And so we have basically women and really young, I want to say kids, they're teenagers. Okay, we had the teens and we had mostly women. And so um, she decided to partner with this uh, organization in El Salvador called Orphan Helpers. Okay, and um, 
that's pretty much what we the trip was about. It was about going to all these orphanages, and, and you'd be surprised how many orphanages they have in some of those countries like that. Kids can't, I mean, parents can't afford their kids, and so they, they give them, hand them over. You know what I mean? So these orphanages are just full of kids, and there's t tons of them. Okay, and so we're basically visiting orphanages, you know, providing for some of their physical needs because we brought, you know, stuff for this money, donations, uh, clothes, all kind of stuff like that. Okay, and then just sharing the love of, of Christ with these young kids. You know, I'm talking about young ones, most of them 12 or, or under. Okay, anyway, at about that day seven or day eight, whatever the case was, okay, one of the guys from the organization approached me. And he said, you know what, um, we have another need. I want like you to consider because no other missions team, no other missionaries that have come here have ever been willing to take it on. Okay, and uh, what he was doing, he was, he was looking for someone to go with him into Guatemala to a boys' prison there. Okay, basically for teens. Some you know, kids basically were like 15 to 18. Okay, not full-grown men, not little kids, but it was a, a boys' prison, right? Boys only. Um, but it was in Guatemala. Okay, and I'm like, boys' prison? I'm like, yes. Oh yeah, that's what I'm. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, that's what I. Thought about missions. I wasn't like, not that I don't love kids, you know, but spending all my days holding babies and 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 I, I was like, yes, this is, what I'm, this is what I'm thinking about. And so I'm like, yeah, I'm I'm in, okay. And so I brought it up to the other two two men that were on the, the trip, uh, and they both said the same thing. They weren't really interested. They're like, this, this sounds like a really bad idea. I don't think we should leave the country. Uh, it sounds way too dangerous. I'm like, oh god, we're just sissies. That's what I think. Um, so anyway, and so then I brought it up to the team leader. Which was Nicole. And our team leader said, absolutely not. There's no way in the world you're leaving a team, you're going into another country, not doing any of that stuff. Well, as soon as she said, absolutely not, um, to me, that was absolutely yes, I am. You know, that, that sealed the deal as far as I'm concerned because no, she wasn't going to tell me no. Okay? And we had we debated that for a little bit. And that is to put it lightly, it was a pretty heavy debate. Uh, but finally she gave in. He said, okay, fine, go ahead and go, all right? And so I was given my passport and enough money to buy a plane ticket back to the United States if I couldn't get back in touch with the team again, okay? And I left with Pastor Rene, okay, one of the locals, okay? And he was doing that, a little bit of that prison ministry. He's from El Salvador, but he, was, the prison was right on the border with Guatemala, okay? And so... I left with him. Now, in order for us to get there, we had to leave like right away. And uh, I was just, when I was talking this over with Nicole, we should really do this together sometimes because from this point on, uh, she was doing her thing and I was doing my thing. And I had no idea what she was doing. And she had no idea what I was doing. Okay. And there was a lot of anxiety with that. You know what I'm talking about? And part of it was I had to leave in such a hurry that I wasn't sure how I was going to get back. Uh, Nicole and the team were supposed to figure that out uh, somewhere along the way because we had a long trip to go. Now, El Salvador is not that big of a country. It's only like 60 miles across. And so uh, to get to Guatemala, it was only about 50 miles, okay? But we weren't traveling by Greyhound, okay? You go to these big bus centers. I don't know if you've ever been to Central America or uh, places like that, but they have all these, these like privately owned buses, and they're all like old school buses. They're yellow, but they paint them like all crazy different colors. They want to attract you. What a beautiful bus. And so uh, we found one of these, these buses. Uh, and we got on. And um, one of the things that I found out after we were on the bus is um, Pastor Rene spoke very little English. I mean, really hardly any. Okay? And you know what Spanish I speak? None. Absolutely zero. Okay, and so now um, just conversing with him was uh, a real obstacle. It was very, very, very hard. Okay, so we have this bus trip. We're only going about 50 miles, but this bus stopped like every couple of miles. Okay, to pick up people. People were getting off, people were getting on. And it was really interesting because it's like everybody in Guatemala is selling something. I mean, in El Salvador. And so every time we would stop, these vendors would get on uh, the bus and they would go up and down the, the, the aisle and, and sell and sell. And so every stop took like an inordinate amount of time. Okay. So to make a long story short, to go that 50 miles, it took us all day. 
Okay? We left early in the morning, and we didn't get there till evening. Okay? It was, that was like the longest 50-mile bus ride I've ever taken in my entire life. Okay? And I'm sitting there with, uh, all, nobody spoke English. Pastor Renee spoke hardly any English, and so there's nothing to talk about, and nobody to talk to, really, and um, it was kind of odd. Anyway, we finally got to the place where we were going to stay overnight. It turned out to be Pastor Renee's hometown. Okay? And what I found out was uh, his uh, wife was actually pregnant. And she was just about to give birth, like any day, okay? And so uh, Pastor Renee checked me into what I would call, at the very least, a no-frills motel. I mean, it was a barren room uh, in the middle of nowhere, really. And they told me he wasn't going to stay with me. He was going to go home because his wife was, you know, about to go into labor. And I'm like, what happens if she goes into labor? I mean, is this guy coming back? You know what I'm saying? But uh, he left. And uh, I have to say, that particular trip did more for my prayer life than any time I have ever imagined. You know, I was constantly praying because I didn't know what even what the next step was going to be. Okay? And in those days, they didn't have cell phones. You know what I'm saying? This was like 20 years ago. Nobody had a cell phone. You certainly weren't going to have one in El Salvador. So there was no way for me to, to find out what was going on with the team. There was no way for me to find out what was going on with Pastor Renee. And so here I'm in this uh, empty room. Um, I didn't even have dinner. There was a place to, to get dinner. I tried going down there, but the, the uh, trying to communicate uh, was like impossible. So I finally gave up. So uh, I didn't eat anything that night. I sat up there and I, I was more than a bit nervous. I uh, can't imagine how relieved I was when Pastor Renee actually showed up the next morning. And so... Um, we left, this time on foot, uh, through some very poor neighborhoods to cross the border into Guatemala, okay, and over to this, this police prison, okay. Um, so Pastor Rene helped me get through security, and once we were on the inside of the prison, he informed me that he wasn't going to be able to stay, okay. Um, he also told me something else, which I found to be very uh, uh, scary. He said, just so you know, nobody else in the prison actually speaks English. So we'll need to pray about that. And so he, he prayed over me. He prayed for my protection, which caused me a little bit of a pause at the time. I'm like, should I be worried about my safety in here? And he's like, no, 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 you'll, you'll be fine. God will watch over you. And then he prayed that God would provide what I needed the most, which was an interpreter, okay? And then he left. And I'm like, okay, so uh, now what do I do? I don't have a clue. I can't talk to any of these kids. And um, in El Salvador, that was in the summertime. I think we went in July. It was like 100 degrees in the shade, you know what I mean? And the only place I found to sit was there was kind of like this little park bench in the middle of the compound, which was out in the sun. All the kids were, you know, in their little cell areas and they were in the shade and I just sat down on this park bench in the middle and they're all like staring at me and I'm just like okay Lord and I start to pray okay and um, it was maybe about 15 or, or 20 minutes or so and my prayers were answered okay a young man showed up uh, from one of the local churches and you can tell that the church people down there they go out and evangelize all the time and they wear uh, navy blue pants a white shirt, long sleeved, and a navy tie. And I'd seen him before and asked about him. And so I, I knew, okay, he had been sent by one of the local churches to evangelize the kids in the prison. He'd never been there before. And you could tell why. I mean, you could tell a little bit about that. I mean, this kid was, was short, he was overweight, and he had like this baby face. I'm not sure exactly how old he was, but he looked like he was about 10. You know what I mean? He was really, really young looking. He looked like the, the kind that those uh, prison kids would have liked to eat alive. Okay? But he spoke perfect English. He'd actually been in the U.S. for a, a period of time. And so he was the answer to my prayers. And I think I was the answer to his prayers too. Okay? He felt way, way more comfortable once he saw once I was with him uh, than he did when he first came in by himself. So we were like this partnership. Okay? And the other thing is he knew where the Christian kids were. Because um, actually, they were locked up in a, a separate area of the, the prison for their own safety. Okay? Um, all these kids that were in there were in there be, because they were gang members. Uh, 
In El Salvador, in Guatemala, it was against the law to be part of this gang. It's called the 18s. I don't know if you ever heard of it or not. They're, they're fairly imposed. Very, very uh, terrible gang. And uh, they were arrested and they were put in prison because they were gang members. And they had no problem uh, demonstrating it. I mean, some of them had 18s tattooed on their foreheads, on their faces. I mean, they weren't trying to hide it. Uh, but every single one of them were in there because they were gang members. Okay? And to be to renounce the gang uh, meant death. And so they, they took the kids, uh, prison kids who had uh, proclaimed Christ and they separated them. And there were about 15 uh, Christian boys among all these other maybe 200 or so uh, gang bangers. Right? And so this prison was kind of a, a scary place. But so um, we found the, the Christian kids uh, and they were preparing for a church service. Okay, the pastor Renee was supposed to lead them in a church service. But now with no pastor Renee, they're like, I hear this through the interpreter, of course. It's like, uh, you, you can lead. Teacher, you teach, you teach us, teacher. And I'm like, okay, talk about being unprepared. Like I said, I, I wasn't a pastor at the time. I've only been a Christian for a couple of years. You know what I mean? And talk about being unprepared. I had nothing prepared. I was just going along, you know, for the whatever. And Pastor Renee was supposed to do all this stuff. And now I was like, oh, it, it's, and now they're all looking to me to lead them in this, this church service. The only thing I had prepared was um, at the end of each day, uh, the mission, I, I led the, the mission team in like devotional. And so I had like seven or eight devotionals prepared for the nights. After we got done uh, with the orphans during the course of the day, we'd meet as a team, we'd do a devotional, you know, pray together, that kind of stuff. Okay. And so I had those, but they were short. Okay, and so I thought, okay, well, um, best I can. I didn't have my notes or anything. Well, I'll try to uh, quote the, the, the scripture verses from the devotionals and, and do a little commentary on that, and it, then that'll, that'll be what I do. Okay, I had really, really only anticipated to do like one. Okay, um, but when I would get done with the one, they're like, more teacher, more, teach us more, more teacher. And so I'd be like, okay. I ended up doing all seven or eight of the devotionals I prepared, right? And they were like still begging for more. You know what I mean? So then I was like, I, I knew that they didn't have Bibles. That was really pretty hard to come by. And so I thought I would just start telling them little Bible accounts, all the ones that I can remember, okay? And so I'm just telling them, you know, the, these uh, Bible accounts that I remembered. And then, you know, like I said, doing a little bit of a commentary on that. And guys, um, just so you know, they kept me preaching for six hours. Six hours I preached to these kids. Uh, and I'm very thankful to God for that. It probably wasn't quite that long because I had to go through an interpreter, which is really kind of weird. I don't know if you ever had an interpreter before, but sometimes I'd say like three words and he would say like, Five sentences. I'm like, did I say all that? He said, yes, teacher. I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, we kind of got through it, but now it's starting to get dark. And now my interpreter informs me that he needs to leave. It's like, oh my, oh my Lord, <laughs> you're, you're leaving me alone again in here. Uh, what is kind of cool, just as my interpreter left, Pastor Renee showed back up again. Um, his wife did not have the baby yet, and so he was back. All right, he was going to uh, get me. And so, just but just as we're about ready to leave, the power goes out in the prison. Okay, which Pastor Ray said that happens frequently. And uh, just so you know, when the power goes out, they lock down the prison until the power comes back on again. I said, "How long could that be?" It was. It could be a few minutes. It could be a few days. I'm like, "A few days? Are you kidding me?" Um, anyway, uh, it actually remained off until the following morning. Okay, so overnight, uh, Pastor Renee and I were locked down with these 15 Christian kids, okay, in this cell. And we did a lot of praying. We just, it's, there wasn't a lot of sleep going on there. First of all, these kids all had bunks. Um, Pastor Renee and I did not. And I wasn't willing to share a bunk with any of those kids. Plus, they were, everything in this prison was pretty disgusting. And we're sitting on this dirty floor. It's like, oh my, it's going to be bad. Okay, anyway, um, but we got through that. And the next morning, I got another really, really cool surprise. Okay, the power came back on the next morning, and there was Nicole and the rest of the team. What I didn't know uh, is they had decided they were going to take the bus and they were going to come and get me from there. And they actually changed the itinerary. They decided while we're there, we're going to minister to the boys in the prison. Okay, now 
I don't know how they pulled it off because I wasn't there, but that was a pretty big thing, okay? They had never allowed any woman in that prison ever before, okay? And I'm thinking there's a good reason for that. This is probably not the safest place for a woman, let alone some of the young, young teen girls that we had on the team at that time. And so, once again, Nicole and I had a discussion about the wisdom behind her leadership. Um, but um, they, were, they were there. They were already prepared. They were going to put on a puppet show. Um, we actually had a puppet ministry in that, that church, and they did some really cool things. And so we, they brought all these puppets, and they were going to do a gospel puppet show that was designed for these little kids, but they were going to put it on for these, these gangbangers. I'm like, I don't know how well these guys are going to um, take a little puppet show for kids. You know what I'm saying? But, well, we'll, we'll give it a try. I said, but don't be surprised because all, all, all I got when I was there from them was like the, the stares of hatred. It's like you look at somebody and you know that they would like to do you harm, okay? And so I said, like, well, I, I don't know that this is really wise, but we'll try it. I said, but you keep all those young girls close at hand, okay? Which didn't happen. They started to spread out immediately and they were talking to the, the, the boys and they were, you know, doing whatever they were doing. But it was so cool, okay? Their presence there like changed the whole atmosphere of that prison. It was amazing. I got to sit there and watch the hearts of these cold, hard boys really become like softened. You know what I mean? And I saw joy on faces that I'd never seen the whole time we were there. Not even on the Christian kids did you see a lot of joy. You know what I mean? Um, but all of a sudden they were they were laughing and they were singing along with they did the puppet show. Our, our team didn't really understand Spanish, but um, they knew how to do the puppets and they played the music that was all Spanish and stuff and, and they were just super engaged with it. It's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. Um, anyway, um, let's go ahead and put the, the pictures up. I'm gonna move on from there. You get kind of an idea. That's the team. And who do we have circled up there? That's a significantly younger Pastor Rod and Nicole um, from back in those days. I mean, I didn't even have any gray hair then, I, I don't think. Um, but that was the team. You see they're mostly uh, young people and women. So go ahead and flip to the next one, okay? Um, the one on the right in the red shirt, that's Pastor Rene. Um, the other young man was uh, like an associate. He didn't go with us to the prison. I don't remember his name. I don't know if Nicole does or not. But the one in the red, that's Pastor Rene that I went with. Um, go to the next one. Uh, that's how we got around while we were there. Everybody got in the back of a big open pickup truck. I don't think that they would allow that around here. It's, it's really interesting. Traffic around there is like super scary. There's no traffic lights. And there's lots of intersections. And people just go and you got to watch out. And it, it's like everything is at your own risk, which is, I don't know if you, you can't see it very well, but that truck was surrounded on all sides by like this big bumper cage. Okay? So if anybody ran into him, they'd get all the damage and he wouldn't get any. Um, anyway, go ahead to the next one. Um, Nicole's standing next to what they call an insurance policy. Okay? In El Salvador, you can't buy insurance on your house, you can't buy insurance on your car, you can't buy insurance on anything. So the way that you keep yourself safe is you hire somebody with a gun to guard it, okay? And this guy was one of the, the guards from, was he from the store? Yeah, go back to the, the truck before, I think. Um, kind of off on the, on the far right, you can see those stairs go. That's actually a big gun tower. We were, that was at the, the, it wasn't the Walmart, but it's sort of a similar uh, place. And so it's got a uh, razor wire fence all the way around and a big gun tower in the middle of it to keep their stuff safe. And so Nicole took a picture with their insurance policy. You see a lot of guys walking around with fully automatic weapons in El Salvador. And um, anyway, um, let's get back to um, the account. I want to share the rest of this with you because um, of all the accounts, you know, all the little Bible accounts that I shared with them, there was one that really resonated above all the rest. It actually happens to be the one that we're talking about right now. Those kids really like relate, could relate to these Hebrew kids that were threatened with their lives, okay? Threatened with a horrible death, they didn't bow down, okay? So let's, let's pick it up in, back in Daniel 
uh, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. And so as they stand before Nebuchadnezzar, they're polite, right? But they say, give him the choice to bow down and worship an idol or die. We'll choose death, okay? They, they, they refuse. They're confident, though, that their God will save them, okay? And rescue them from Nebuchadnezzar. But the one part of this that really stood out, right, um, to the boys in the prison was this next verse. So go ahead and read verse 18. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. It was this verse, but even if he doesn't, right, even if he doesn't, we'll never bow down to another god. Okay, because that's what those Christian boys in that, that prison um, had uh, sworn to one another. Right? They made a pact with one another that they would never renounce Christ okay, and go back to the gangs, regardless of what happened to them. Right? And so I just put down, you know, hardship has a way of revealing what's really inside of us. Okay? Hardship has a way of revealing what's really inside of us. And what I saw in those boys was a resolve. Right? And it reminded me of another Bible account, because I see this as well. It's an account of another group of, of Christ's followers. It's in John uh, chapter 6, verse 66. At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. So we read of a time, this was, was still Jesus was still walking the earth, and it tells us that when um, following Jesus started to get hard, how many of his disciples walked away. Right? And they followed him no more. See, because guys, there will always be times when following Jesus will be hard. I mean, Jesus makes it clear about that from the very beginning. There's going to be times when it's going to be hard. And that's when you find out the reason, right, why people follow. Throw, put up the next one. There you go. Um, the true reason why people follow Jesus. See, Jesus had a huge crowd that followed him because he healed them, he fed them, he'd done a ton of miracles for them, and so he'd grown this huge following, okay? And, and later in his, his ministry, he stopped doing so many of the miracles. He stopped doing the, the feedings, okay? And he started to ask for a commitment, okay? He started to, to ask that they would do something in return. And this is the point where many of them decided they would stop. I said, this is too hard. Now you're asking us for something in return? It's way too hard. And they followed him no more, right? And when the majority of his followers had walked away, Jesus turned to the ones that were left, okay, and asked the question, what about you? Okay, is this too hard? Would you like to leave? Is this too hard for you? And I love Peter's response. Go ahead and read it. It's in John 6, 68. Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. Peter says, where will we go? You're the one that has the words of eternal life. See, guys, Jesus alone is the Savior, right? Jesus alone has the power to forgive our sins, Jesus alone is the one that can make us right with God, right? We don't follow Jesus so that we can have an easy life. That's never what we were promised. And you got to take a close look at anybody that promises that uh, because Jesus doesn't promise it, right? We follow Jesus because he alone has the words of eternal life. That's why you're a Christ follower. Now, I have to be honest, there's been times along the way, especially early on in my Christian walk, where it's like, this just seemed too hard. And I, I considered walking away from the faith. But I always came to the same conclusion after I'd have one of my tantrums with God because he wasn't giving me what I wanted or uh, things weren't going the way that I thought that they, they should. But every single time I came to the same conclusion, it's like, where would I go? Where am I going where it's going to be better? You know what I mean? Where else could I find eternal life? 
Go ahead and read next from Daniel chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. Um, it were said, Nebuchadnezzar is furious. No one has ever stood up to him like that before. And he wants to make sure that no one will ever do that again. So now he's going to make a big spectacle of it. Right? He has the furnace stoked seven times hotter than it usually is. I mean, this thing is like blazing, right? And he orders the strongest men in the army right, to take these three Hebrew boys and bind them and toss them into the, the furnace to make it clear. They're not getting away with anything, okay? So they bind them tight and they throw them in there and... Uh, I'm not going over all of this. You can kind of look it up if you want to. Um, but we're told that when, when, the, when the soldiers go to throw them in the furnace, it's so hot that the soldiers throwing them in, they're actually consumed by the heat of the furnace. Okay? Now next comes uh, the really amazing part. So let's read that. It's in Daniel 3, verse 25. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire, unharmed. And the fourth looks like a god. So Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace. He expects to see, you know, these guys going out in a blaze of glory. But instead, he, he's, he sees the Hebrew boys walking around in there. And more than that, there's not just the three of them. Now there's an extra one in there. There's a, there's a fourth one in the fire, right? And he said, he looks like a god, right? And so Nebuchadnezzar calls him out of the furnace. Let's go ahead and pick it up now in verse... Uh, 27. The fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed, and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell a smoke. See, the, the fire had not consumed them. It didn't even touch them. It didn't even burn up their clothes. They didn't even smell like smoke when they came out of the, the furnace. Right? Now, the, the takeaway, guys, at the end of this, the takeaway is when we're with Jesus, we become untouchable. Did you know that? The Lord Jesus will become untouchable. And it's not that we don't suffer physical loss or physical pain. We we'll promise that that will happen. Okay? And just so you know, although Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, although they were spared that day, I promise you, the day came when they died. Right? We're all going to suffer and die one day. And that's a, a, a given. So, guys, our immortality is not this physical one. We're not physically immortal. But we have a, a spiritual immortality, right? And that's what makes us untouchable. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Okay, guys, this is the time where we're going to move into our, our time of communion. Um, just so you know, Nicole, I could tell, is probably dying to, to, to correct me or, or give her side of the story. Like I said, we should probably have done this uh, together. You may want to ask her what was going on because there was like those three days in there where she was doing, still doing her thing and had no idea what I was doing. And I was doing my thing. I had no idea what she was doing. And we just, you know, we just, even as I talked about this, she was telling me stuff that was going on. I'm like, really? I don't remember that. It's because you weren't there. <laughs> That's why. Um, anyway, you can, you can ask her for her side of the story. I'm sure she's dying to tell you. But um, let's move into our, our time of communion. And guys, it's, it's scripture always tells us that before we take communion, okay, we should always examine ourselves. It's not something that we should do lightly, like just something that we do each week. And so um, before we take communion, we, I always make sure we have a couple of minutes for that self-examination, right, as the scriptures tell us to do. And that's where you, you pray that the Holy Spirit would search you and reveal anything. Uh, reveal any sin that you need to confess a sin so that you can be forgiven of that or can reveal anything. Sometimes it's, it's something that you need to do. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just going to suggest to you if there's something you need to confess, confess it. You don't have to confess it out loud. Uh, God can hear you even your thoughts. Okay? And if it's something that you're convicted that you need to do, I'm going to encourage you to do it uh, because those convictions don't go away. We have a tendency of hanging around, and the Holy Spirit has a way of nagging us uh, sometimes until we comply. Okay, but this is our time uh, of self-reflection, and so let's just take a minute or two to do that, and then we'll take communion together. Okay. <laughs>
the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after he'd given God thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Each time you eat it, remember me. And so we do. We read that on that same night, after supper, he took the cup. And again, after he'd given God thanks, he said, this is the new covenant, which is in my blood. Each time you drink it, remember me. And so we do. And then, guys, as we remember Jesus, it's always um, appropriate to give him thanks. And so I'm going to do that for all of us right now. If you guys just bow your heads with me. Let's just thank our Lord and Savior for all that he has done for us. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you. Once again, as we always do, we thank you that you gave up uh, a bit of your divinity to come here to earth, to become incarnate and walk among us. Um, more than that, Lord, although you led a, a perfectly righteous life, you were persecuted for the things that you did. Ultimately, you were uh, nailed to the cross. It was for us, Lord. You carried our sins to the cross so that we would not have to pay that penalty, that we would not have to die. You died in our place, Lord, that we might have eternal life, and we're so thankful for that. Uh, you were faithful to uh, your mission, what you were called to do. Lord, help us to be faithful to the mission that you called us to do. Let that be our way of, of giving you thanks, just in our faithfulness. And so we just thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.